Hello, everyone, and I'm so glad to be here. Hey. So, how do I introduce myself? Uh, I'm originally from Russia, so I have a heavy accent. Please stop me if I say something and you don't understand. Uh, I am a homeschooling mom of three kids. I um, have my degree in astrophysics and I taught um, math and science in private schools. I worked at NASA for quite some time. Um, and um, right now I'm running an online science program for kids. And um, I'm also helping with Alliance of the Indigenous Mass Circles and another program uh, um, for Indigenous groups. And um, I am writing for Forbes Education as well. So doing lots of stuff. So I wrote a book a while ago on the informal mathematics. Uh, I was doing mathematical circles for about 10 years, um, starting with my own kids and then it grew and grew. So today I'm going to share some of my observations and some of my ideas that um, um, I made when playing with the kids and uh, doing some early math with the kids. So let me share my screen. Um, and I'll make it big. Just a sec. So, and today I want to focus on questioning and mathematics. More on questioning than mathematics, actually, but we'll see how it will work. So the art of inquiry.net is uh, the science programs that I'm doing right now. And uh, I will share the links to these resources later on. This is what I used for this lecture. Um, the PDF book is the book I wrote for uh, those people who teach little kids. And it is a free PDF. You can get it on Natural Mass website. It's called Bright Brave Open Minds. And there are some other links, again, that I will share at the end of the class or after the class. So let's start. My mother made me a scientist. Easy, she would say. Did you ask a good question today? That was Isidore Rabbit, the Nobel Prize laureate. So questioning is extremely important these days uh, because our world is changing very fast and we don't really know many answers to the questions we are going to face right now, starting from this pandemics to uh, artificial intelligence to high tech to genetic engineering and whatnot that is coming. We do not, as a humanity, we do not, as adults, have answers to those questions, to those problems yet. But what we can do is we can actually model good questioning to our students and to our children. Uh, to, we can support our children's ability to question rather than suppress it and help them to analyze and make conclusions. So questions are extremely important and they should be encouraged and they should be nurtured. And also lots of people that I spoke with being, you know, a dean of the math department of an Ivy League college, a professor of physics, a NASA leading scientist, they, all of them, when they talk about the students who come to them, they say, we don't really care about their level of knowledge. That's okay, they will learn. They say, I can teach them anything, but they should ask questions. When the kids come to a new situation, new job, they need to know how to ask questions and they shouldn't be intimidated by the need to ask questions and they should feel comfortable with questions. And this is something that we can start doing when the kids are 
very, very young. So, and it is the right age for the kids to, uh, you know, they, they are naturally curious, right? They naturally treat any problem as a new problem. Uh, they are greatly motivated by unsolved problems when they're young. All we need is not to suppress it, is to help them to preserve that. So, and they should understand that not knowing is not a failure. The, not knowing is not something to be frowned upon, but actually it serves as a guide for future exploration. So with that, let's dive in. And then I'm going to talk about, about very simple examples and very simple activities that everyone can do but we can talk how we can actually support the kids questioning. So tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe is a very familiar activity for everyone, right? Um, almost everyone knows how to play if you just have this field, three by three. If you start with three by three, this is the simplest one. And you put X's and O's there until you get three in a row. So now I want two volunteers here. I'm going to um, open a whiteboard. You know what, uh, Dave, can you please make me a co-host so I could share a whiteboard? I actually, you know what, I don't even need it, obviously. I guess I can do it here. Let's say I need two volunteers and you can pretend play your students to play a round of tic-tac-toe with me. Um, I would need those people who know how to use um, the annotation so you can actually draw on my screen. Thank you, Ms. Vicente. We have one person. Who else? You know how to play it. <laughs> uh, one more. Just, yeah. So um, please start. So, um, Ms. Vicente, go, go as the first one. Um, Choose whether you want X or O. Uh huh. Very good. Who is the next one? Whoever was the next one, put your O there. Uh huh. John. Ah, we have John and Jacqueline. Just one of you. I'll, I'll let you play. You know, okay, John, could you move your thing a little bit because it's not clear where it is right now? Let's put it inside the square. Uh huh. So we'll say it's in the second row. Yes. Yes, you are blocked. <laughs> Oh, okay, very good. So this was the first round. Now I want you to do something different. Instead of, uh, I'll, I'll clean uh, the um, drawings. So now, instead of playing the regular round of tic-tac-toe, I want you to do the opposite. It's called the inverse tic-tac-toe. And those, and those who put three in a row lose. So try to do it again. But this way you want to avoid putting three in a row. Uh, same people here, okay? Uh 
Joan, you're next. Uh -huh. You want to avoid putting three in a row. Yeah, see, you, you are forced to put yours there, okay? Um, yeah. So, how does it feel to play an inverse tic-tac-toe? Tell me. Non-competitive. Non-competitive? Uh, what else? Thank you. Uh -huh. It makes you think a little bit more differently because you're just used to just um, having that three in a row. Mm -hmm. Changing up mm -hmm. your strategies. Do you feel you, you, you use a different strategy or the same strategy? I, I, I missed what you said in the previous sentence. I'm sorry if you could repeat again. Same strategy, but how does it feel? It doesn't feel normal because we're so used to doing it the other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things I want uh, to suggest you do with the kids. Every time they play, some type of a simple game. Let them play several, several rounds of a game the way you do it, and then let them change the rules. So, what value do you see in inversing game rules? Is there any value in inversing? It's thinking outside of the box. It's not following the rules it's it's changing the rules it's it's going beyond the norm which it, 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 yes uh -huh. if you think about it those people that want to go to mars started thinking out of the box they didn't Excellent. automatically stop at no we can't do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's liberating uh, it kind of opens your mind, absolutely. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, so, and it helps the children see that they are the owners of this mess. They're the owners of the world they live in. They have the power to change it, even if on a very small scale, and explore it. So, lots of things can be done with the tic-tac-toe that, of course, a very simple game, but great example of what can be done. You can increase the game field. So instead of playing three by three, you can go five by five, for example. It will, you know, increase the complexity a little bit. You can also go and do a 3D tic-tac-toe, which gives a completely different feeling to the game. It uh, still the same strategy but your brain is working differently your brain is working in 3d and if you want your children students to actually design um uh, uh three by three um uh, i cannot draw <laughs> tic-tac-toe game they love designing it they learn about three, uh, third dimension. And the older kids, like fourth, fifth graders, they just love it. Because the complexity is increased, they actually do something to build their own game. And they continue asking questions like, what else can be done? What can I do with this mathematical tool, right? So the question, what 
if, what if I change the rules is an extremely powerful question in mathematics, in science, and in general. For example, in mathematics, uh, the question, what if I redefine the operation of addition and, and multiplication led to a completely new uh, field of mathematics called tropical mass? The question about whether uh, the parallel lines could cross led to a completely new geometry, right? So it is a great question to encourage the exploration. So I definitely suggest that you try it with your kids. Uh, so have a board of activity on a regular basis. It will be very chaotic, not somewhat chaotic that they say here. It will be very chaotic at the beginning <laughs> until they learn. But you will see lots of creativity unleashed. You will see that the kids actually see themselves as the owners of mathematics that you're doing. And it may be a very small thing, but you will see how different their attitude will be. So, um, exploration with dominoes. Uh, lots of people play dominoes with kids, with young kids, to help with their number sense, right? To help them to identify the numbers with their geometrical representation. It's a very simple but very powerful way of introducing numbers to really young kids, to pre-K kids, some kindergartners may love it too. So lots of people, of course, uh, use it to teach kids the inequalities, right? Find the same, the similar thing. Uh, so, and there are lots and lots of different domino games, like four and four, right? Six and six. And this is a nice game for younger kids, but you can do something else. The equalities there look, asking you only for one right answer. What if you turn it into inequalities? Okay. This is going to become a completely different cognitive load for the kids, right? So instead of saying, find a domino that has the same number of dots, as my domino, tells them, find a domino with a number of dots that is less uh, or more than the one on my domino. And you can change the rules a little bit. So for example, if you have your domino like uh, uh, three and four, you may actually add ask them to find the dominoes with the sum of the dots that has less or more than this one. So not only you introduce the inequalities here, something else is different. What, why does it feel different? Why is it more difficult for the kids? What do you think? It has two different things they have to think about. They have to add or subtract, and then they have to also compare. Mm -hmm. So there's more than one thing they have to do. Right, so you have to do more operations at once, but there is something else there that, that is different. I think a really important difference is they have to imagine something that's not possible, that's not, it's not just comparing with something that's there. It's not exactly. Yes, yes, yes. But also, these are, these are amazing suggestions. Thank you. One more thing that makes it more difficult is that there is no right answer here. You may have different right answers 
that fit. You know, when we're teaching arithmetic to them, they get so used in school, they get so used that there is one and only one right answer. But this particular game, twist on the game, actually tells them that several right answers may work. And this is usually what happens in life. You know, when you prepare your breakfast, you can eat this set of uh, food or that set of food and all of them will be right. You know, uh, maybe not just one right answer. And this shows them that there is freedom in mathematics. So lots of people get mass anxiety when they think that there is only one right answer and they have to look for it. But when you show them there are many, and many of them may be right, and people, you know, can find different ones and you can help your friend to find another answer. This makes it more collaborative. It makes it more open. It feels different. They lessen the anxiety, this type of open-ended problems, and they encourage the exploration. And you as a teacher can create lots and lots of open-ended problems. Very simple ones, with, even with the kids who don't really know any numbers yet, like you can draw an airplane, a boat, a butterfly, and a rocket. So four pictures. Ask them which one does not belong. Tell me. Uh, put your answers in the chat. Or oh, talk. Unmute yourself. Butterfly. So butterfly doesn't belo belong because? It's a um, live uh, creature where the others are created by man. Okay, so this is one of the solutions, right? And yes, you are right. You, you, you have your own reasoning why it doesn't belong. Can some, something else not belong? Could the boat not belong because the airplane, butterfly, rocket, they all fly? Exactly, right? So our second solution, anything else? The boat doesn't belong because it's a one-syllable word. Oh, see? <laughs> More. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. Well, if we're going that way, rocket doesn't belong because it doesn't have any long vowels. <laughs> okay. So we can also rocket. say, uh -huh. go ahead. Rocket also doesn't belong because the rocket can go out of the Earth's atmosphere while the rest oh. of the state is closer to Earth. Yes, yes. All of them need uh, air to move, right? Butterfly, boat needs some wind, airplane needs some atmosphere. Rocket does not, yes, uh-huh, absolutely. So you see, you can come up with lots of problems like that, even for really, really small kids, and they love it. You, of course, can come up with an opposite problem, with a Venn diagram where you actually see how do these things, what do these things have in common, and they just love it. And again, little kids um, can just use pictures or little figurines, um, little stickers to move things around in the Venn diagrams and uh, consider which ones have something in common. And older kids may do exactly the same thing, but with more mathematical objects. So let's move on. Undefined problems. Lots of the problems we do in our mathematical textbooks, school textbooks, 
are well defined problems, which is a very rare creature in the real world. Most of the problems we face uh, in our real life are not well defined problems. We usually don't have enough data to solve them. We usually have to look around for some help, for, do some research, look for some support, look for instructions and whatnot. Very rarely we get nice, well defined problems in the beginning. If we want the kids to feel comfortable with undefined problems that they're going to face in their life, in their later academic studies, we need to help them to recognize those problems as undefined, play with them, recognize them, we see them as, you know, interesting, fun problems that they can deal with. And um, this is a problem I was giving like to really small kids, like five-year-olds. Uh, so this is a problem about cat mom and several kittens. So I ask them, it is known that two kittens weigh less than their cat mom. Do three kittens weigh more than their mom? So what kind of response do you expect from your students? I know littler kids will probably say yes, because there's more of them. Exactly, yes, uh -huh. Many of little kids, uh, many of little kids will do that, yes. But it all depends on what kind of kittens they saw in their life. Some of them saw newborn kittens, and some of them uh, saw some more grown up kittens, right? So. Depending on what grade you are teaching, what, what, what do you think your students will say? Yeah, you are also. Uh, would it also would it also depend on if the mom is depending on the size of the mother? Would, right. Would that exactly. be a, because there are some mommy cats that are small, and there are some that are bigger. Mm -hmm. it just, right. It would depend. Right. So I can share with you what my students <laughs> did in one of the classes. It was very fun to watch them. So they had lots of discussions. They were arguing with each other. We had a class like kind of split uh, in two halves. One half was saying, yes, they will wait more than their mom. And another part was saying, no, they will wait less than their mom. And then we had a boy who said, they wait the same. And at this point, you know, they just, there was silence in class. They realized that something is missing. And then they started arguing like whether the kids, uh, the kittens are well fed or not. So they thought that if the kittens are well fed and just ate, they probably wait more. And if they uh, are not well fed, they uh, wait less. So they had lots of discussion until they recognized that they have this uncertainty, that they cannot solve the problem the way it is given. They realized that they need to start asking more questions and what kind of questions now from here, what kind of questions would your students ask after they realize that they don't have enough data? What kind of questions could be asked here? How old are the kittens? How old are the kittens, right? Yes, what else? 
How much do they weigh? Mm -hmm. How much do they weigh? <laughs> Even, you know, more, uh, it get, get, gets you closer to the answer, right? Do they weigh the same? Do they all weigh the same, exactly. Are the kittens um, eating both um, like baby kitten food and the mother's uh, milk or are they just eating mama's milk? Yes, yes, uh -huh. absolutely. So you see, now their brain starts working. Instead of just going to one solution or one number as they love to do, you know, you give them a problem with numbers, they just start adding, subtracting, dividing, multiplying without even thinking about what they're doing. If you give them undefined problems, simple undefined problems on a regular basis, they will know I cannot just start adding numbers or I cannot just start doing something. I actually have to think about what this problem is about, what is missing, how can I get that information? And again, it can be, you can start it with really, really small kids, like a problem like this. Right? So we just, kind of discussed it, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but, but I have a question to you. Do you actually give undefined problems in your class? Sometimes just to have my kids think about something. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it? <laughs> yes. Not as often as I would like, because I think uh, interims and standardized tests are kind of pushed a little bit more as the forefront of instruction compared to students getting their own insights, coming up with their own solutions, just have that out of the box thinking I know those people who are teaching in public schools, you are really pressed, you know, in terms of time and requirements. So maybe doing it as some fun activity, maybe. Uh, I know in private schools, uh, teachers sometimes designate a day in a week to this type of activities. Um, like mass circle type activities and have um, non-school mass introduced alongside with the school mass. Again, only of course, if your administration will be willing to support you in that. You can also suggest to the parents to practice this type of problems with the kids. So, This is an optional homework for you if you want to do it. You can also try it as a good end of the year activity. So you can ask your students to come up with some fun and defined problems. Not you doing this, you, you will model them, of course, but then ask your students to do it. They just love it. And you can collect them and make a nice uh, newsletter for the parents something like an activity to do over the summer. And so it's, it, it feels nice. It's not pressing, uh, uh, you know, the kids to find the right answer. It can be silly enough and so on and refreshing. So I also wanted to talk to you about math and inventions. Lots and lots and lots of mathematics goes into all types of inventions we have around us. From uh, very basic things like uh, that people used uh, uh, from ancient times, like making a shoe so it fits. Uh, designing a kayak is 
not easy at all. Lots and lots of mathematics goes into it. Designing a snowshoe, lots and lots of mathematics goes into it. How, how do we recognize that math and those inventions and how do we actually demonstrate it to the kids early on as an inspiration? So something like that, just looking at different things and recognizing math in them is extremely helpful. I also want to show you how difficult it is, <laughs> even with very simple things sometimes um, to solve problems like this. So in, this is a problem that you can give to the kids of any age. You can also give it to adults. Um, and compare how long it takes both kids and adults to solve it. You will be surprised. So let's say Beth has three bricks and a ruler. Beth uh, is not a geometry student yet. She has no idea about Pythagorean theorem. She also doesn't have a drill to drill through the brick, but she needs to measure the internal diagonal of that brick from point A to point B. How can she do it? You may need a couple of minutes to think about it. No, no. No, no, I was saying don't be don't remind me of open actually, but that's not the course. No, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> this kind of activity may take like half the classroom time for the kids, depending on the age, of course. And they argue with each other. They, they come up with all types of problems. They, uh, uh, I mean, solutions. They suggest that they uh, break the brick in half, he tells them, no, you cannot saw it in half, you cannot break it, you cannot drill through it, no. So, what can they do? And eventually they usually come up with two or three solutions, which is impressive. Uh, is somebody saying something? I hear someone talking, but I can't hear um, that well. It sounds like somebody is unmuted. Who doesn't attempt to be. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I thought that maybe I'm just. Um, I would think that if it was me and not knowing geometry very well, diagonal, I would measure from A across to the to the opposite corner. So you need, what you need, I am probably so you, you need something that goes inside. Yeah, uh, but I mean to visualize it. So you, you start experimenting, right? Like that. Yeah. Very good. But you will realize that, of course, if you go around, it will, it's much longer than what's... Right, used. right. Yes, it's, right. It's, it's, if, you can, if you can go from here to the, this corner, I don't know, and then maybe add half of the length from this corner to this corner. <laughs> I don't know. This is what I'm that's, thinking. That's a good, 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 good start. Good start. Yes. So, 
uh, the first thing you do and the first thing your students will do is probably something uh, along the lines, right? They, they start playing with the object. They start figuring out how does it work? How does it look like on different sites? What can I do with it? Celia, can I say that um, we're asked, this is all in front of them on a piece of paper, right? Oh, so I can give them uh, blocks. Okay. I can give them, yeah, depending, depending on the age. If they're okay. like fourth, fifth graders, uh, I, I, I can give it to them like on okay. a piece of paper. Yes. If they're if they're li li little ones, I'll just give them, you know, wooden blocks. Because if, if it's a little one and they have the actual manipulative in front of them, the little wooden block, I think they would really play with it and figure out what can I do? And maybe you can give them a, a, um, some yarn mm -hmm. and you can help them to tape sure. it from one point and see how they can manipulate it to get to B. Yes, but the problem is you cannot get to B because you uh, have to drill through it if you want to get to B, right? So yeah. you need to come up with some ideas there. That, that's what I mean. They would start coming up with ideas on how would they get there because mm -hmm. they can't go through that solid object. Right, right. So manipulatives would be very helpful in this case. I'm sorry, I cannot give manipulatives to you right now since we're on the Zoom. In the, in the real classroom, I, I, I just a pile of blocks and lots of yarn and rollers, yes. Jackie, okay. you want, uh, well, what I was going to say is if they have a variety of blocks, they're, they're looking at this block, but if they had some like two squares or something, or if they had some um, uh, triangles, you know, three-dimensional triangles or whatever, pattern blocks that maybe they could, I don't know. I guess I'm just visualizing there all the good, good, good. Yeah, 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 moving in the right direction. But these are three blocks that are all the same. So they're not uh, different ones. But yeah, yeah, I, I see you moving in the right direction now. So uh, I can see how they could become rather frustrated with, you know, um, not being so able to come up with the correct answer because they've been taught they need to have the answer. Um, but this would be a good problem to explain to them that there's not always a defined answer. There's not always... This one has a defined answer. Oh, it does? Oh, absolutely. I saw <laughs> I had a seven-year-old kid and his dad, who was a PhD mathematician, trying to solve it. And I and dad was in one room and the kid was in another room, and the kid solved it faster than his dad, who wouldn't <laughs> just forget his Pythagorean theorem. And uh, really tried <laughs> to use that knowledge. It couldn't just use the ruler and sum something that he had at hand. Uh, let me know when you want to hint. Uh, Julia, um, let's see, maybe building a model of it at home and 
measuring it that way would probably be the best thing. Uh, how do you build the model of it? You're almost there. How do you build the model of it? Re read, read the problem one more time. Um, let's see. I need the measurement. <laughs> no, 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 don't do the measurement yet. You, you, you do the model. You do the model. Forget about the measurement at the moment. How do you make a model of the... Uh, well, for me, the I would probably use like a cereal box or some kind of box that's available to me. Mm -hmm. Or if not, use a, a fill it with a paper, making a, a paper brick shape model. Okay, but you don't need to go anywhere. You, you already have everything you need given in this particular problem. Read it one more time. You would deconstruct it. How? If you, um, oh, let me see. Let's say you know that this is a, I'm not a very good dryer, drawer here. But then you can you can, you can draw uh -huh, and then, right here. And then uh -huh. you do this because that would be the top. Yes. Uh-huh. And this would be the bottom. Uh-huh. And, and you're having to measure from here. Not exactly. No, almost there. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh <laughs> surface net, uh, uh, you want to do a surface net of this thing and take it. You, you could do it if, if you have enough yarn, I guess, and could keep it in the right shape. I'm answering Joanne. Ginger, you're almost there. Just one, one more thing. And don't put them one on top of another, uh, but move them around a little bit and you will do that of them around. Yeah. Think of how you could do it. You know what, you can, you don't have to draw Lines. I know. I'm you trying to visualize. You, you, you can have blocks there, right there. I mean, it will. Right, be right. But I'm trying to visualize it here. I, I was just saying in annotate. You, you can just. They have shapes. Couldn't so. you just um, measure the flat side, one flat side of one brick, and then measure the the narrow flat side of another brick? The way if you the way she had a do, draw. If, if you don't know the mathematics, if you can, don't know how to derive, it will not help you. Or you are actually need to measure it directly with your ruler. Hmm. I, I see we as a group are almost there, so. With John's surface net idea, think of how you can do the surface net without the surface net here, John. <laughs> uh, with Ginger moving the blocks around and yes. Um, Jane says, place two bricks. Can you draw? So we will see. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right, Jane. Uh -huh. Could you draw and um, show it to us? Oh, your computer wouldn't. Okay, let me do it for you so uh, to make sure that. Uh, Oh, yes. Okay, Ms. Vicente. Yes, thank you. Please do it. Uh-huh. And? Yes. 
And what? I'm just gonna and add. one on the top or on the bottom, it doesn't matter actually. On the top. You, you, you see how, how it can be done? Um, no, 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 not like that. Right, right under the one of those, or on top of one of those. This one is too big. We need just one. We have only three blocks. So they're the same blocks, right? So let, let me, yes, exactly. Thank you so much. So this is what's happening here. With three bricks, we can have like an empty, model of our brick, right? And then we will go like and measure it. So we will create a model of a brick without the brick. Do you see that? It's kind of difficult to do it with 2D. Let me see if I can actually, hmm, this thing is not going to allow me. No, uh, you know what? Um, if I can do this one. So we take this block, take one, put one on the top of it and put one on the side. This way we can measure from the lowest point of the lowest brick to the top point of that high brick with the roller. Do you see that? I don't see it. You don't see it. You know what, let me, just a second, let me try to do it then uh, like this. Take this one, control C, control. No, what was that? Control C, control V, and control D. Here we will do. So I put one under this one. Ah, I cannot really put it under this one. And like this. Right? This thing, I, I, I need to move it to get rid of it. So, and then, I can draw a line from here to here. Oh. You see that now? Yes. So, so I, I didn't think that we need to draw the solution as well. So, here we are. Ah. Ah. So, do, do you see it now? Is it, is it better now? So, um, kids usually come up with this idea as they're playing with the manipulatives. So they figure out if they can do it. Uh, another way, of course, if you have snow or if you have clay, you can just put your brick there, make an empty space, right? Model as Jacqueline suggested, and then measure inside that hole. Right? So this is usually one of uh, the other options that the kids come up with. They do play with clay more often than we do, with clay do. So they understand that. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, clean all of these things. 
helped us so you can invent uh discuss mass inventions in your classroom you can also ask that your students to check what kind of simple little mass inventions do your parents do do your grandparents do at home and you will see they may be doing something with a door lock they may be doing something with a table uh, with the pipes, with uh, other little things around the house where the students can uh, notice and recognize mathematics. And then you can make a picture collage about it or a newsletter about it. It's like a detective, mass detective um, activity for home. So, and I'm going to share a few more activities that I took from a really old article from 1946 um, written in Russia called The Principles of Selections and Composition of Arithmetic Problem, which says, what can be simpler than 3 minus 2 equals 1? So, in school math, uh, there is often a lot of focus on just the mechanical habit of calculation. The problem is that this is important, of course, but you also need to understand how and when to use uh, these tools. So these are some examples on the problem. 3 minus 2 equals 1. And those, all of those problems, they require the same uh, operation, just 3 minus 2 equals 1, that's it. But they require completely different thinking models. The problem number one is usually uh, creates no problems for the kids. I was given three apples, I ate one of them, how many are left? This is a very straightforward problem. Usually kids have no problems with that. However, as you start asking them other problems, you may see that you can create actually much more complicated problems for them with just the same, very simple math. So the second one, is already creating problems for kindergartners and uh, maybe first graders. Like a barge pole three yards long stands upright in the bottom of the canal with one yard protruding above the surface. How deep is the water in the canal? You will see lots of kids not able to answer this question because here, instead of dealing with just different objects, you are dealing with one object. And you have to mentally cut it in several pieces. And you have to recognize how to deal with it. The next question creates problems even sometimes with fourth and fifth graders. How many cuts do you have to make? to sew a log into three pieces. If you ask them like four, five, seven, instead of three, this will be even more difficult for them because each of those pieces requires them to think about it, uses up their um, operational memory, uh, needs them to imagine all of this objects and operate with them, really not easy. Now, a train was due to arrive one hour ago. We were told that it is three hours late. When should it happen? When should we expect it to arrive? Again, from a student's point of view, this is not three minus two equals one problem. 
This is a completely different problem that requires them to think about time, to think about the whole situation as train schedule difference. So here is the problem for kindergartners, three minus two equals one. It turns into a problem for a second grader, third grader, easily, or maybe even fourth and fifth grader. A brick and a spade weigh the same as three bricks. What is the weight of a spade? Here you need to understand what the equation is. Right? Here you need to visualize it as a balance scale and understand how to take a brick from each side simultaneously. Again, this is not, you can introduce this problem as a problem for a, kid, for a kindergartner, especially if you do it with little figurines or little toys on both sides with a balance scale. If you do it with the manipulatives, you can do it with a kindergartner. If you don't do it with the manipulatives, this is probably a problem with a bit older kid, right? This is something. Yes. N and H are cities in adjacent homes, so time zones. What time is it? It is in Navajo and it is 3 p.m. in Hopi, for example, right? Uh, this is something the kids can actually be aware of, especially those kids who live, uh, who, who cross back and forth. So, but again, this is a completely different type of problem. And I'm going to show you three more problems. Again, all on three minus two equals one. That will require, you know, a fifth or sixth grade um, thinking. Same as. In the still water, I can swim three kilometers in three hours. In the same time, a log drifts um, downstream one kilometer in the river. How many kilometers would I be able to swim in the same time, traveling upstream in the same river? Again, same mathematics, completely different thinking process, right? So I would ask uh, those of you who are teaching fifth grade, uh, is it a good problem for your student? Like uh, difficulty wise. I, I, I have several teachers of fifth grade here. What, what do you think? Uh, feel free to unmute. What do you think? How, how would your students react to it? What? That's what they're going to say. What? <laughs> uh, what, would be, uh, what, what would be the difficulty here? I say knowing the terminology, vocabulary being used in the yes. word problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not the mathematics specifically, not the mathematical operation mm -hmm. that creates the problem, right? Because it's again, it's three minus two. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it is the understanding of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And how could we help them to see uh, 
what this problem is about, what kind of questions should they ask in order to understand this problem? Uh, for kindergarten, I would think it'd be a lot. Just knowing that log drifts, what is a log drift downstream, the environment, the, the location that we're living in, it's not likely. Oh, see, know, it, they'll dictate no. everything in our story there about first understanding what a log drift is downstream the river, traveling upstream, and then diggers, trench, I think, and a telegraph pole. <laughs> train passes and this I think understanding what those what those objects are will help them figure out so the first thing is it's and like written in foreign language for them right almost Sometimes. they just don't know the words mm -hmm. so uh, what else so first of all we need to explain the terminology to the kids even the if they're able to do the math again, it's all three <laughs> mistakes all fun. But they don't understand the terminology. What 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 other questions should they ask? Like first, first they need to ask, what is this? What is this thing about? Right? What is the situation? What's going on there? What, what other questions may they want to ask in order to understand these questions? Uh, this problem is better. Maybe if they if they can um, if they understand what the question is asking. Mm -hmm. So what what's what's difficult about the questions here? What operation do I use? So, but see, this is the secondary thing. Uh, what operation do I use? Is you are actually giving them the answer basically. Then they just do it. Right? You don't want them just to do the operation. They already know that three minus two equals one. They learned it in kindergarten. What you want them to do is to understand how to dismantle the problem, William, how to understand what's going on inside this problem, and only then apply their mathematical knowledge. See, this is why questioning is so important. They really need to question themselves. What don't I understand in this problem? What questions do I have about this problem myself before I even start doing something? Because the technical part here is very simple. What is not simple is understanding the whole situation. And this is... So that what I'm saying, the problem most of the time is not the kids not knowing the technical skills. Sometimes they miss it, but again, in this age, you know, with Google and calculators and so on, you know, we need to introduce them to that, but it's not even that important. What is important is to understand what they are doing with those technical skills, right? And um, th this is quite an issue. Uh, the kids, uh, the ninth problem may be problematic even for to some high schoolers. And even though it's still three minus two equals one. So the complexity is not in the mathematical iteration. The complexity, the problems that the kids have is that they don't even know when they don't understand. They don't know how to ask questions when they don't understand, how to dismantle the problem into smaller uh, parts, which they do understand. And so, so we cannot just teach the mass routine. They really need to. Or learn how to ask questions. Okay. Um, so this is something that the kids can do in order to learn that you actually can give them three minus two equals one or whatever you are studying, right? And 
ask them what questions and stories would they write about these examples and ask them to share with a friend and solve that problem. You can model several interesting problems with them and then ask them to come up with more and more interesting problems. I had little kids asking all types of very strange <laughs> um, um, questions like, um, there were um, three tigers in, in the zoo and then two wolves got sick. And you immediately see uh, you know, they, they don't understand that they should compare apples to apples. Uh, so as soon as your students start writing questions uh, about something, it, it helps you to see what are they missing there? How do they don't understand uh, how the word problems are built? So you may want them to build word problems themselves and then analyze them and then play with them. So what questions would you like to ask about three minus two equals one? You can ask a question questions uh, or pretend what your students would ask about them. Um, my students would ask me, what if you write them in different colors, would it still be the same? And um, every time they ask me questions like that, I have to think like, what if I think about it in terms of color addition? Right? with rainbows and stuff, will that still hold? So you can expand on, on your students' questions. So uh, right now, try to ask me one or two silly questions about three minus two equals one. The sillier, the better. Or think of what your kids may ask. Of course, the first question people, students usually ask me, is it always true, right? And they ask me, is it true with big numbers and big objects and small objects? And they ask me, um, is there a difference between living and non-living objects when we operate with this? And you know what? In, there are cultures where you count living and non-living things with different words. You, you actually have different names for the numbers and so on. So, you know, you may want to think more about it, uh, but every problem, every math example can be turned into a set of questions. And those questions may be unwrapped. Even if they look like silly questions from a child, you may think of what mathematical component is there. And you can help the child to see the depth of it. Uh, one more great source of questions, of course, is paradoxes and logical fallacies. 
And um, this is something I used with the kids. I would tell them all dinosaurs had a brain. I have a brain, therefore I am a dinosaur. Okay. What would you say in this situation? Like, uh, what do you think? Uh, what, what? How do you think the kids <laughs> reply to this? My students would love it. <laughs> would they see a problem? No. So. Uh, would they the agree? They'll remember all day. <laughs> how, how old are they? They're five. Oh, five, five year olds. Five going on six. Yeah. This is, if uh, I said this, this is the only thing they'll remember all day. And they'll remember <laughs> it every day. Yes, yes, yes. So you can actually, they, they love logical fallacies like that. And you can help them to actually build more logical fallacies like that. Because this way, first of all, they start noticing it. Second, it is fun, they remember it. And third, they actually start figuring out how the logical thinking is made. They will see that this statement is not exactly correct, right? There is something missing there. So, um, you may, uh, I, I had kids, they would come up to me and say, a boy would come up to me, for example, and say, all girls in my family uh, uh, love to play with Lego, I love to play with Lego, therefore I am a girl. So they would figure out how to build this funny logical fallacies. And then, of course, I would ask them, you know, if I would say all kids have a brain, you know, for a kid or all teachers have a brain, hopefully, <laughs> I have a brain, therefore I am a teacher, that would, you know, sound absolutely normal. What's the difference? And so, so uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful set of uh, source of questions. Um, and um, you can, you may want to make a comic book of those syllogisms with your students. The funnier, the better. And help the, um, you know, share with their parents and so on. Some parents love to play with it as well. So this is the first step for the kids to start understanding that even if something flows, logically, if you start uh, with something that um, is not fully completely true, right? How would you change this syllogism? Uh, uh, uh. Well, what's wrong with this statement? How would you redesign it so it will be right? Maybe substitute dinosaur with a different animal that isn't extinct yet? Well, um, still, um, you know, if, if we say all birds have a brain, I have a brain, therefore I am a bird, still kind of doesn't work. Yeah, my cup's in there, the red one. There's two red uh, This is one of them. You don't care? I don't care. They're still cut. So I think someone is unmuted. Uh, so oh, mine had cookie crumbs in there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Mrs. Uh, Would you please mute? 
Huh? Why is there crumbs in it? Oh, it's dipping my cookie in there. <laughs> okay, so I think I don't nah. have much time. So if I would say all dinosaurs, look around, only dinosaurs have a brain and I have a brain, then that would be a true statement. But I don't say all dinosaurs and only dinosaurs have a brain, right? So, which makes it a false statement. So, what if all math problems were fun and how would we do it? Um, one of the ways is to take a fun problem, the one that you really, really like, and make it boring. When you make a fun problem boring, you see what you have removed. You see what was that part that actually made it fun. And then when you experience encounter a boring problem, you can try to add that part to this problem to make it more fun. So, and you can invite your students to do it as well. Explore some fun problems, try to make them boring. Question, what makes a fun problem a fun problem? And then present them with a list of boring problems and ask them, why don't you make these problems fun? They would be much more willing to solve a fun problem problem. We don't have to wait for someone to bring us fun problems. We can actually teach our students to make those problems fun for themselves. Wouldn't it be wonderful? So I think this is the end of my class today. Uh, please ask me questions. I'll quickly flash a picture I made of the bricks during your talk. All right, let me stop sharing. There are the bricks and a ruler. Yes, thank you. 